Good morning, Freedom. It's so good to be with you today. I miss you guys. I can't wait till we're back in the house of the Lord. But we're going to get into the Word today. I just want you to sit back, relax. We're going to have a good time. It's so good to be with you today because every week that we meet online is one week closer to getting back together. Amen. What a time it's going to be. I've really enjoyed our time together. Watching as you comment during the message on the watch party, it's so cool. I really enjoy that. It feels like we're all together as one, even though we're not in the same building, we're together in the Spirit, worshiping and just enjoying the presence of the Lord. We're being fed together. It's so cool. But I can't wait to see you face to face. I don't know what's going to happen when we get back together. Our first Sunday back, the band's going to fire up and we hit that first note. I don't know that we're going to be able to stop worshiping, amen? I think our, our first song may go on for an hour and a half or something, but it's going to be hard to stop. And get into the word because the worship, I believe, is just going to fly in here. It's going to be amazing. So what I want you to do, I'm going to ask you right now, is start preparing your heart for that first Sunday back. Can you do that? Because I believe our worship is going to the next level. Our worship has always been intense. It's always been amazing worship in here. But I have a feeling that we haven't experienced anything yet. I'm expecting when we get back together, I'm expecting signs, wonders, miracles to break out. I'm believing for addictions to be broken off of people's lives. I believe people are going to be saved, delivered, set free as they walk through the door. I'm expecting joy on every face. Amen. I'm expecting to see the sanctuary full and the overflow full. It's set up. It's ready to go. So we're ready for everyone to come in. So what I want you to do is start inviting your friends now, even before we have our first service. Start inviting your friends. Share the videos online. And they, they need Jesus. The world needs Jesus right now. Amen. I believe every church is going to be full. I said it the other day, I think there may be lines waiting for the doors to open. They're ready to come in. People are going to come early. People who used to sleep in on Sunday morning are now going to be in line ready to get into the house of God because revival is here. Amen. Can you say that with me? Say revival is here. Just speak it. Amen. The days of church as usual are over. I believe people are looking for the real deal, don't you? They, they're looking for the power of God. And I can't wait to start sharing testimonies with you of God's goodness and the power of God. I cannot wait. There, he's been doing some amazing things during this time, and it's going to blow your minds. He's so faithful. Galatians 6, 9 says this, Let us not grow weary. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we will reap if we don't lose heart, if we faint not. For those of you who have held on during the tough times, you've been walking with the Lord through the difficult seasons of your life and felt like maybe God wasn't even there for you. You felt all alone. You're about to reap a harvest of blessing that is going to shock you, I promise. Just hold on to those words. You're about to reap if you faint not. You've been paying your tithes and it didn't seem to work. You've been praying and nothing's happening. You, you've been believing and the mountains haven't moved. But I've come to tell you today, hold on, baby. You're about to see the goodness of God. I mean, I can say that because I'm living it right now. In the middle of this global pandemic, God is doing amazing things in the life of my family and in the life of this church. And when we get back together face to face, I'm going to share that with you. I'm not going to share it here online, but when we get back into the house of God, I'm going to begin to share some things that God is doing in the life of this church. It is so awesome. You don't want to miss it. I want to share it with you. You're going to be excited. Some of you have known this is your church. You know that God sent you here. He sent you to this ministry. God has spoken to you in dreams, showing you about the future of this ministry. He's shown you what is about to take place. And you've been asking God, where is it? Many of us have been holding on for years, knowing the worship's getting more intense. The, the word, we're getting deeper into the word. God, when is this thing going to break loose? And I've come to tell you today, it's at the door. It's at the door. Do you remember what this year is? This is so cool. God spoke to us at the beginning of 2020, said this is the year of the open door. Now, what I want you to notice is every time the Lord gives us a word, he would get a word from the Lord, the enemy sends opposition to, to stop that, to get us out of our stance of faith into unbelief. So what he's, God says, this is the year of the open door. What happens? Our doors are literally closed here at Freedom. Every church, they're closed right now, right? So the, the level of opposition is letting us know the level of word that we've already received. It's so cool. And I don't know about you, but it's encouraging to me because the greater the battle, the greater the breakthrough. I want to say that again. The greater the battle, the greater the breakthrough. And why would God says this is the year of the open door and Satan does everything he can and even closes the doors on the church to try to get us to doubt what God has spoken. That lets me know 110% God is on our side and this is indeed the year of the open door. Amen. 
So I believe when the doors open back up, we're going to be packed, we're going to be full, and you guys are just, we're going to just go into worship like we can't even imagine in the presence of the Lord. Amen. It's going to be an awesome time. So I encourage you, don't get, don't get upset, don't get discouraged. Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. So here's what I'm asking you to do. We're, we're going to be able to endure what we're going through right now for the joy that's on the other side. What's the joy that's on the other side when these doors open up and we're back together in his house? We're able to hug one another, high five one another. We're able to shout, walk around the aisles in the middle of worship and I mean, just let loose. All right, so hang on. You can endure this if you look for the joy on the other side. Somebody say amen. I'm already preaching. We haven't even got into the word yet. <laughs> amen. Are you ready to get into the word today? I am. Can you, can you tell? <laughs> I'm ready to get into it. Last week we talked about living stress-free. And the believer is supposed to live from the inside out, right? The kingdom of God is not what we eat or what we drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So our assignment is, we looked at this last week, and I encourage you to do this, our assignment is to wake up every morning knowing that I've been made righteous. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Get out of bed every morning. Before you get on Facebook, before you, you turn on the TV and watch the news, just realize in your heart and remember in your heart, I've been made righteous. Number two, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, which gives us peace. It's not the absence of chaos and confusion. It's the presence of someone, the presence of the Holy Spirit. So there's righteousness, peace. And then number three, we have joy because the joy of the Lord is my strength. When I understand that all of my sins are forgiven, my sins and lawless deeds he doesn't remember anymore, it it produces joy on the inside of me. So when I wake up aware of those three things, righteousness, peace, and joy, my day is going to just fly smoothly, amen, and you're going to be blessed and with no stress. <laughs> That's awesome. So when we, leave, when we live life aware of these realities, stress and worry have to leave. They just have to. So I want to continue to talk about this because so many people are stressed out right now, they're worried right now, but I don't believe in the life of the believer that we're supposed to be like that. So I want to continue to talk about this. What we need right now in this world is perfect, perfect peace. What you need in your life and your family, what, you, what they need and what I need and what my family needs is perfect, perfect peace. So we're going to get into it today. If you're ready, just say, let's go. Let's go. Here we go. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, right before he was going to die, he decided to share something with the disciples. And I want you to look at this. He knows the next day he's going to, to be beaten and lead into the crucifixion. So he begins to share from his heart. If you know that you're going to die, you're going to, you're going to share the most valuable things you have on the inside. That's not the time for you to hold back, right? Jesus knows that he's about to be crucified, so he doesn't have much time left with him. So this is what he shares from his heart right before he goes into the crucifixion the next day. John 14, 25 through 27. We're going to read these verses, then we're going to break them down. <clears throat> these things have I, spoken, I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now let's break it down. I want to go to verse 26. We're going to, begin to, we're going to get into Bible study. Verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And I want to zero in on that. He will teach you all things. Now, just for a moment, I want you to forget about everything you've been taught in church. Maybe you've grown up in church. And I want you to push everything to the side. And I want you to think just for a moment. Here comes Jesus. He's standing before the disciples. And it will say he's standing before you. And he says, the Holy Spirit is going to teach you all things. The reason I want you to think like this is because many of us have been taught in, in church that the Holy Spirit only teaches spiritual things. But Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He's speaking to us today. And he says, the comforter, the helper, is going to teach you all things. Everybody say all things. All things. That means that the Holy Spirit now teaches me how to have a healthy marriage. It teaches me how to handle my finances, how to raise my children, how to be a good father, how to be a good husband, how to be a good leader, how to be a good pastor. It teaches me, the Holy Spirit teaches me all things. Say it one more time, say all things. All things, that's every area of your life. If I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is going to teach me all things, then I will go to the world for counsel. 
All right? And we know that the blessed man in Psalm 1 doesn't go to the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So if I'm not supposed to go to the ungodly, then Jesus says, I'm, I'm leaving the Holy Spirit with you. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. He's going to teach you all things, not just spiritual things, all things. He's going to show you everything. He is the teacher. Amen? Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 2, 20, and verse 27. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Just to reinforce this a little bit. 1 John 2, 27. I turned to the wrong one. There we go. 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received from him, the anointing is the Holy Spirit, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things. There it is, concerning all things. The same anointing the Holy Spirit teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. That is so cool. So the anointing, the Holy Spirit, lives on the inside of us, of course, and he teaches all things. He teaches everything, how to be a mother, how to be a wife, how to be a father. How it teaches, he teaches everything to us, amen? So now let's go back to John 14. John chapter 14, verse 26, and we'll keep going through this. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to rem- to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So he will teach you all things and then bring to your remembrance all things that he said to you. Now let's go to verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now now these verses go together, and what I'm going to do is we're going to go back to the beginning and begin to connect the dots and just tie all this together. This is what he's saying. Number one, the Holy Spirit teaches us all things, right? The Holy Spirit brings to remembrance all things that Jesus has said. Jesus has left his peace with us. Jesus gives us his peace, not the world's peace. And then he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So what is he telling us? Jesus is letting us know that the Holy Spirit teaches us, and this is how he speaks to us. He speaks to us with the the presence of peace or the absence of peace. I want you to get this in your heart. Many times God speaks to us with the presence of peace, peace shows up in our heart, or the absence of peace. I don't have a peace in my heart. Many times that's how he speaks to us. Now, a lot of people say that God talks to them all the time. He's, some people, some Christians you run into, God's talking to them every five minutes. And he tells them what time to get up in the morning. He tells them how long to brush their teeth. He tells them what to eat for breakfast. He tells them what to wear. And that's okay if he talks to you like that, that's cool. But can I be real with you today? I'm really careful around those people because a lot of them who hear from God every five minutes, God never told them to to tithe and support their local church. Hmm. God's talking to them all the time, but he hasn't told them anything about unconditional love. Hmm. God's telling them what socks to wear in the morning, but he never took took the time to tell them to stay out of people's business. Hmm. Are you with me? You can get mad and you leave. It's all right. You're not here, so you can't stand up and walk out. I'm just messing with you. But that's what I think about. People who hear from from God all the time, he tells them what to make for dinner and what to do here and where to go over here, but he doesn't tell them the big things. Then I question, are you hearing from God every five minutes? Are you with me? And I'm not putting you down. If God speaks to you, he's spoken to me twice in my life with an audible voice. I've actually heard the voice of God twice, but it doesn't happen very often. So what I'm sharing with you today is many times, most of the time, the way that God speaks to you is with the, the presence of peace in your heart or the absence of peace. Does that make sense? You'll have a peace in your heart. There are sometimes I call it the, uh, just a divine download. I'm in here praying and all of a sudden just boom, it's in my heart. And I know it's the voice of the Lord, but I didn't hear him speak, but it's just in my heart. He just downloads it like a computer. Boom, it's right there. So sometimes he'll speak like that, but most of the time it's with the presence of peace. You'll, you'll know that I just have a peace in my heart. I know that I'm supposed to do this, whatever it is. Or there's an absence of peace. I don't have a peace about this, so I'm not sure that we're supposed to do it. Does that make sense? So many times that's how he speaks to us. This is how we make decisions for the church. And I've made mistakes in the past because I went against this. If we don't have a peace about it, we don't do it. If I don't have a peace in my heart when the decision is to be made, then we don't do it. 
It doesn't matter how good it sounds, how good it looks. If I don't have peace in my heart, we don't do it. One time we were sending the youth group to Indianapolis just to a concert, and Julie and I didn't have a peace in our heart. And in fact, I couldn't even sleep at night. I couldn't rest. I just I was like, man, I, just, I don't think we're supposed to send the kids, and we talked about it. So I made the decision, we're not going to send the youth group to, just to Indianapolis. It's not that far. But were they disappointed? Absolutely. They were upset, but they understood. And I remember telling one of the leaders, I said, we'll never know in this lifetime what God just saved us from. We will never know. But all I know is in my heart, I did not have a peace about it. I couldn't even sleep, couldn't even rest. And we don't know, maybe he saved us from, from a car accident. Maybe one of the young people or the driver would have lost their lives. We don't know, but there was a, a, something on the, in, the absence of peace. There was something on the inside that says, I don't think you're supposed to go. That's how many times that's how God speaks to us. Now, several years ago, we took 30 kids with 30 of us. We went to Georgia three years in a row. We stayed for an entire week each time. No problem. We had a peace. Everything went smoothly with it. So God many times will speak to you with the presence of peace or the absence of peace. And you need to, that's what he's talking about, is you need to hold on to that and realize when he's speaking to you. All you have to know is the presence or the absence of peace. You don't have to be deep and super spiritual. You just, if I don't have a peace about it, I'm not going to do it. Does that make sense? Turn over to Colossians 3, verse 15. Colossians 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That word rule in the Greek actually means to rule as an umpire or a referee. Think about a volleyball game. The ref only blows the whistle when the ball goes out of bounds. He doesn't keep saying, in, 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 right? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. In other words, let the peace of God rule, decide, make all the decisions in your heart. And many times it's the peace that you feel on the inside. He's ruling, he's saying, don't go over there, don't do that. Don't send the kids on that trip. Joe, I'm not, I'm not giving you a peace on the inside. The peace isn't there. Don't do this. Are you with me? You seeing this? All right, John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. That's what I want to look at. That word leave is literally the word bequeath. When a dying man bequeaths his estate to his son, he gives it to him as an inheritance. So Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, hours before he was going to die, he bequeathed his inheritance. He says, here's my peace. I'm leaving my peace with you. I'm giving my peace to you. And, and not just peace, but Jesus says, my peace. You have to understand this. Because as Americans, when we think peace, peace, dude, peace, man, peace. But that's not what Jesus was talking about, all right? He, who was he speaking to? He's speaking to his Jewish brothers. So he wouldn't have said peace. He would have used the word shalom, shalom. So he said, my shalom I leave with you. My shalom I give to you. So then we have to find out what shalom actually is. What does it really mean? In Strong's Concordance, shalom's, shalom means completeness, soundness, welfare, and peace. Shalom is completeness, wholeness, wellness, soundness, welfare, health, prosperity, and peace. It's all of those wrapped up into one word. So what did Jesus leave behind for us? What did he give us? This is so cool. He gave us his own health. He gave us his own prosperity and welfare. He gave us his own soundness, completeness, wholeness. He gave us his peace. Now, shalom is the, the Hebrew word for peace, but the word for peace in the Greek, the New Testament's written in the Greek, is the word Irene. So if your name is Irene or your middle name is Irene, it means peace. But remember, Jesus was speaking to his Hebrew brothers, right? So he used the word shalom. I want you to get this. Jesus says, my peace, my shalom, I leave with you. I give it to you. So he's telling you today, he's saying, I give you my health. I give you my prosperity. I give you my wholeness, my wellness, my completeness. I give you my peace of heart. I give you my peace of mind. You get that? Just say this with me. Say, it's mine. It's mine. Jesus says, I'm leaving this with you. And he didn't say, I'm leaving my peace. He says, I'm leaving my shalom, my completeness, my fullness, my, my wholeness, my peace of mind, my prosperity, my peace of heart. He says, I'm giving it to you. I bequeath it to you as an inheritance because you belong to me. Man, isn't that awesome? 
That's a good place to shout right there. So the issue really isn't whether or not I have peace in my life or health, or prosperity, or wellness, wholeness, completeness. As a believer, I have it, right? As a believer, as a Christian, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. You have it. So the question really is, why am I not experiencing more of it? If I have it, right? We believe that. Jesus bequeathed it as an inheritance, gave it to us. Why am I not experiencing more of that? Because I believe it's mine. When we look at these verses, Jesus is doing everything, right? I want to break it down for you. He's giving us the peace. He's bequeathing it to us as an inheritance. He's saying, I leave this with you. I give this to you. Jesus is doing all of the work. So there's only one thing that's required of you and required of me, and it's in verse 27. Check this out. This is all we have to do. Let not your heart be troubled. That's it. Let not your heart be troubled. That's what we have to do. That's something that I have to do. Is something you have to do. Now, here's the problem. I can't let not for you. <laughs> I can't let not your heart be troubled. I can't keep your heart from being troubled for you. I can't do it for your family. I can't do it for my family. I can't do it for Julie or Sam. I, can't, I can only do it for me. This comes down to each individual heart. Let not your heart be troubled. That means me. So I can't do it for the entire church. This is individual. It's for you. If we do this, then the peace of God begins to flow and increase in our lives if we can go through life without letting our hearts be troubled. And I I want you to get this, this, just remember this, get this in your mind and in your heart. Your heart is the valve by which peace flows out. Your heart is the valve, and there are valves in the heart, right? Interesting. Your heart is the valve which peace flows from, from heaven, and it begins to flow out. You do not want to let your heart get troubled. I'll explain that in a moment. Notice that he says troubled before he says fear. Because there are a lot of people walking around saying, I'm I'm guarding my heart from from fear. I'm not walking in fear. I'm not scared of the economy. I'm not scared of this virus. But they allow their hearts to get troubled over small things. So he, he addresses even that. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. So he talks about a troubled heart even before fear. You would be surprised how troubled your heart is when you begin to become aware of it. Just, I'm talking about the little things. You're not living in fear, but you're concerned about the economy. Worried. I'm concerned about this virus. That's worry. Are you with me? Are you with me? It's worry. Now, I want to share with you one of the most important things you're ever going to hear. And I feel like this every time I get up to minister to you. Uh, there's just always something in the message. I'm like, this is the most important thing, but this, this really is. This is going to open the door for blessings in your life. I want you to, I want you to get this. One of the most important things you're ever going to hear. And we understand that grace makes and faith takes, right? Grace is everything that Jesus, the finished works of Jesus on the cross, has made available to me. And my faith is how I gain access, is how I take it. So grace makes and faith takes. But here's what I want you to see. How do I maintain everything that grace has made available? How do I retain it? How do I hold on to everything that grace has made available? How do I hold on to it and not lose it? You ready? It has everything to do with your peace. Everything to do with it. The peace of God will keep and retain everything that he's given to me. Peace. Grace gives to you, but your peace keeps it. I want to say that again. Grace gives it to you. My faith is how I access it and grab a hold of it. But the way that I maintain it and hold on to all the blessings is the peace that's in my heart. Do you want to know what area of your life that grace isn't flowing freely in right now? The area of your life that grace is not flowing freely in, look at the area that concerns you the most. The area that worries you. I'll give you an example. If you're freaking out about your finances, grace can't flow freely in that area. The area that you don't have total peace in, that's the area that grace can't operate freely. If you're constantly worried about your finances, grace isn't flowing into that area. Are you seeing this? Why not? Let not your heart be troubled. Your heart is troubled in the area of finances, and you're not sure, God, I've seen you help Joe, and I've seen you help so-and-so, and and I've seen you help her, but I don't know about me. Your heart is troubled in that area, and it begins to just, er, it stops flowing into that area. Does that make sense? If you're stressing out about your marriage, your relationship, that's the area that grace isn't flowing freely, because let not your heart be troubled, or your health. 
I'm trying to get my health back. Lord, you're just not healing me. I don't understand what's going on. If you're troubled in that area, that's the place where grace isn't flowing freely into that area. Somebody say amen. Let not your heart be troubled. If you're constantly dwelling on how lonely you are, your loneliness right now, and I understand that, but that's where if your heart is troubled in that area, that's where grace is not flowing freely. Any area that your heart is troubled in, grace is not flowing freely into that area. Now check this out, Proverbs 4.23 from the New Living Translation. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Other translations say, guard your heart above all else, for out of it flow the issues of life. It flows, it's that valve. In other words, when your heart is troubled, the flow of blessings and grace is stopped in your life. Wherever you are troubled, wherever your heart is troubled concerning your finances, your health, your relationships, your marriage, whatever it is, where your heart is troubled, that flow of grace has stopped. It's like the garden hose in the backyard. We've talked about this, but I want to take it one step further. That garden hose, when you put a kink in the hose, the flow has stopped. Now, here's what I want you to see. The source has not stopped supplying the water. You stopped the flow. Next to the house, there's a faucet, and you turn the faucet on full blast. The water is flowing through there. You put a kink in the hose. The flow has stopped, but the source hasn't been shut off. I'm preaching now. Don't miss this. The moment that you unkink the hose, the water flows. The issue was not the source. The issue was you. Now, this is good stuff. I'm going to amen myself. In other words, the issue is my heart. When I'm stressed out and I'm worried all the time, it stops the flow of blessings into my life. The problem is not my source. The problem is my heart. That's the kink in the hose. Whenever I'm worried, whenever let not your heart be troubled, when my heart is troubled, The flow doesn't stop. The grace doesn't stop from the source. It's already provided 2,000 years ago. Somebody say amen. But now it has stopped right here, stopped coming into my life. Why? Because of one thing, my heart is troubled in that area. It's not the problem with the source. The faucet's turned on full blast. It's the kink in the hose right here, the valve of my heart. Somebody say amen. This is good preaching today. When I'm stressed out and worried all the time, it stops the flow of blessings into my life. So Jesus tells us, he says, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we're going to go deeper into this next week, but I want to challenge you today. I want you to notice every time over the coming week, I want you to notice every time that your heart gets troubled. Can you do that? You're going to notice it, I promise you, in the little things. You're going to notice that your heart has been troubled over little things. When you wake up, sometimes we get troubled about all the things we have to accomplish that day. And I'm not saying ignore your day and don't, don't make plans. That's not what I'm saying. But when you feel your heart starting to get overwhelmed or troubled, then this is what you do, all right? This is, what, this is what I want you to do this week. Anytime that you feel your heart getting troubled over anything, even pulling out into traffic and you're like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it on time. I've got this going on. I've gotta get here. I've gotta do that. And your heart is troubled. This is what you do. Quote this scripture. Say, let not your heart be troubled. Can you do that? Just say, let not your heart be troubled. Every time you notice that your heart is troubled over something, oh, I'm kind of overwhelmed in this area. Maybe it's the finances. I start thinking about the money that we need by the end of the month, and I start thinking about, are we going to go back to work or this virus? Anytime your heart gets troubled, just say this. Say, let not your heart be troubled. Can you do that? As you go through your day, just keep quoting that verse, and you're going to notice it's the little things that have been troubling you. There are some big ones, but it, you get, we get troubled over small things. You're going to be surprised how many times in a day that your heart actually gets troubled. But as you speak the word of God, you're going to notice that his peace will begin to flow into your heart, and then the trouble goes. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you receive this today? I just wanted to share this with you because many times the, the blessing is already there. The source has already provided it, but it's our heart. Let not your heart be troubled. That is what is putting the kink in the hose and the flow has stopped into our life because we're troubled with our marriage, with our finances, with our health, whatever the area is. Any area that you're troubled, you'll notice that grace is not flowing into that area. Somebody say amen. So we're going to close there today. We'll go a little bit deeper next week. We'll get into it even further. So I want you just to get ready. Your life is about to change. If you take this and begin to apply it to your life, and, and realize and say, Lord, help me. My heart's been troubled in all of these areas. I want the flow to just keep going into my life. 
He will help you. Amen? So you're about to start walking in blessings that have been there the entire time, but a troubled heart has had them all bound up. Your troubled heart, the problem was not on God's end. It's been on our end. It's been our heart. He told us, let not your heart be troubled. It's what he said right before he was going to get beaten, right before the next day he was going to get beaten and crucified. He says, let not your heart be troubled. It's one of the most important things he told us. So I want to tell you today, just get ready because everything that you've been believing for, every blessing is at the door. It's been there the entire time, but it's been your heart that's been holding it up. It's been blocking it. Amen? It's been there the entire time. So I just wanted to encourage you with that. I wanted to bless you with that. I, I am excited about the future of this church and this ministry and what you, you guys are, you're sending me messages and notes and, and all kinds of stuff just to encourage me. And it is encouraging me to see how you've grown through the last year. And it's all, even the last couple of weeks, you're continuing to get in the word on your own and even some of your worshiping on your own. It's just an amazing thing to see. So I just wanted, wanted to encourage you today. Let not your heart be troubled. All right, let's get ready for communion. Go ahead and grab your communion elements, and we'll get ready for that. I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. It's the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So I want you to say what we say when we're together. Just say, This is for my healing. This is for my healing. The Lord made a way out for everything that sin has brought in. The Lord has made a way out for us. Amen? This is for my healing. So, Father, we thank you for your word today, Lord. We thank you that we're able to meet even online. Even though we're not able to meet together physically in the building, we're able to meet online, and we feel your presence right now, Lord. We thank you that you have made a way out for absolutely everything that sin has brought in. We praise you for that, Lord. We understand that as we eat this bread and drink this juice, that it's for our healing. And we stand upon your word, Isaiah 53, verse 5, that by your stripes we are healed, First Peter. 1 Peter 2.24, by your stripes we were healed. We believe that, Lord, and we receive it today, knowing that you're healing us from the inside out. You're restoring our youth. You're strengthening us because we have discerned what this is for. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow, I missed you guys. I can't wait till we get back together. It's going to be an awesome time. I can't wait just as a church. We like to like to take communion together. It's just a, an amazing time in the presence of the Lord. So I just want to encourage you, let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it be dismayed and don't don't live in fear. And whenever you can You can turn that over to the Lord and say, Lord, this is the valve I understand. I'm not putting a kink in that hose. I'm not letting it be troubled. So the blessings are going to flow. Lord, just let them flow. Just say that with me. Say, let them flow. And I promise you they're going to begin to flow into your life like never before. So I miss you guys. I love you with all of my heart. I cannot wait till we're we're back together. I I just want to physically see you. It's cool. Some of you, I see you online. You're sending messages and calling and stuff. But I just want to wrap my arms around you, give you a big hug. I've missed you so much. This is been dragged out long enough. Amen. It's time to get back in the house of the Lord. So I just, I just want to encourage you today. Stay in faith, believing everything's going to be all right. Don't let the enemy take you off of that stance of faith. Just stay in faith, believing everything's going to be all right. I love you guys.